Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope everyone had a good lunch and not too much food coma out there, but um, I'll try my best to keep you uh, awake and uh, engaged. Um, so, yes, Andrew Coppin, Managing Director of FarmBot. Uh, we're one of the old uh, ag techs around. Um, the company started about five years ago. Um, and it's a case of, um, for me, it's a case of I liked it so much I bought the company. I was an early stage investor in, in the company. Telstra asked me to have a look at it because for my sins I grew up in the Kimberley chasing bulls around on horseback. And they said, Coppo, you must know something about this. Can you please come and have a look? Um, so after a 20 plus year um, career in corporate finance and funds management, I'm now running a, a really exciting ag tech. Such is my conviction that um, this is a, a really, really interesting space. So I'll tell you a little about our story today, let, let you know a little bit about where we're going and also happy to talk about the broader adoption of ag tech um, and how I see that um, as one of the, you know, veterans in the ag tech sphere, um, not just because I've got grey hair. Um, and um, oh, I'm also one of the founding directors of the Australian Agritech um, Association, which has been set up to try and help people better navigate um, ag tech, both from the investors coming to Australia, don't know where to go, and the farmers coming off the paddock. It's hard to navigate ag tech, so it's so great to see a, a good turnout here today and the interest being so high. So our um, proposition at FarmBot was that, you know, which won't surprise any of the primary producers in the room, and shouldn't surprise anyone, that, you know, water is the lifeblood of all agriculture. Nothing happens without it, um, and yet in some ways we sort of treat water with a bit of contempt, um, maybe because it comes from the sky or under the ground and there's this sort of perception in some areas that it's free, but we decided, hang on, what if we really manage water closely? What would we know? And surprise, surprise, five years and millions of data points later, what we're working out is when you look at the granularity of water as an input in agriculture, you can learn a lot. A lot more than just driving up to the tank and going, have I got water or don't I? Or, you know, when I've got it, I won't worry about it. And when I haven't got it, I'll, I'll pray for it, um, which is not a great strategy I've found. But because, you know, every farmer, I've ne never met a farmer, uh, if you're the one I haven't met yet, put up your hand, um, that whose first thought of the day isn't about sort of weather and water um, and, and, you know, with good reason. If you had a million dollars walking around in the paddock or planted in the paddock uh, that would die without water, you should be pretty focused around it. Um, and my, what we found is that most of the... Um, uh, whoop, where are we going? Most of the alternatives for managing water are pretty antiquated. Um, you know, right on any given day in Australia, there's 10,000 people driving around to check water that probably in many instances does not need checking. Now I can hear the, the you know, old school saying, yeah, but we do a lot of other things while we're going around, and that is true. Um, we are not advocates for get rid of Bob the Borman. We're advocates for allocating resources where you need to, when you need to, and also for gathering data in real time. Unfortunately, um, no matter who does the bore run, there's nothing to say that as you're driving away from that tank that the pipe doesn't burst um, an hour later. We don't know these things, but with the adoption of new technology, we can start to remove the costs of the a huge cost associated with um, monitoring water and also um, put in far better um, mechanisms for gathering real-time data. And that's, that's been our thing, is to look at a cost-effective, data-rich solution that can provide certainty. And the thing that we hear the most from our customers is that we're giving them peace of mind. People said, oh, you know, Coppo, you're going to be selling peace of mind to people. I'm like, well, I don't know, why would we be doing that? And it, what we've learned is there's so much angst and stress. It can't, the, the primary producers carry around worrying about water because they can't see it and they don't know what's happening when they're not there. Arguably, there might be some people in the room right now who are wondering what's happening in the back paddock while they're in, in town today. So we created a device, um, it's the one you see on the tank there, called the FarmBot Monitor, and it's the, it's the core device in our portfolio of um, Internet of Things devices. It's, 
it's real time, it uh, gathers data on your water ecosystem and, uh, and alerts you of changes in your water ecosystem. Um, and by that I say that the machine learns how the tank and or dam or turkey's nest operates over time and gets progressively smarter in forecasting what should happen next. And if what should happen next isn't what happens because the water falls too fast, goes up too fast, or does something that it doesn't normally do, it can send you an email or a text message telling you exactly what is happening. So to this end, we've now got people that are waking up in the morning all around Australia, checking 10, 20, 50, some 100 more watering points on their phone or on their laptop over a cup of tea and then they're allocating where their resource, their human resources should go and what they should do, which is a very far cry from what the old school method is. So, you know, obviously providing them with complete certainty, better decision making for forecasting about what I'm going to do and where I'm going to move things in the future and, you know, relative to uh, driving around, it's a ridiculous cost saving for, for most. So we, we did this, you know, pragmatic solution, which gets us onto the farm um, and starts the conversation. And a lot of people said to me, Copo, water monitoring, I mean, hasn't that been done to death? And I'm like, well, maybe, but, you know, we've adopted an approach of consumer electronics. If we can't put it in a box, send it to someone, have them install it on their own in five minutes, and then it works reliably for, for all the foreseeable future, and we say our device is good for seven years, um, then I don't think that has been done before because previous iterations of this require directing towers, um, technical support, and a whole bunch of other expensive things that only came after the fact. And our view is we, our relationship starts with our customers the day they install the device. Not, it doesn't end that day, it starts that day. Because to us, it's all about the data. It's all about what information are we learning about um, the, the water ecosystem where we can serve up actionable insights to the farmers that are using it. Not just things like, hey, your pipes burst at 11.30 on a Friday night, which they do. It's either Friday nights or birthdays, I'm not sure. But, you know, the um, most inconvenient times when these things happen and, um, you know, that, that's obvious. Um, the, the weight uh, losses that are incurred from animals being off uh, water and getting stressed and all those obvious things, but we're also now looking at large data sets where we can start saying, hang on, if this happens, event X happens on Wednesday and event Y happens on Fridays, 98% of the time this other event happens on Sundays. So we're actually data mining huge pools of data about water ecosystems, which will lead into the much sought after sort of precision grazing outcomes that everyone's been talking about for a long time, but not delivering. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So we've now got this, this uh, chart was put together a few weeks ago. It's now um, redundant already. We're, we've got over 2,000 units. We're, we're selling about 250 to 300 um, a month at the moment, and, and so we're growing strongly. I think today's figure is closer to 2,500 um, all around Australia. And we've adopted a sort of satellite-first uh, communications um, view. Um, so whilst we are comms agnostic and we have devices that use satellite or 4G or MBIoT, um, we think the, the best solution for us more often than not and also the future of where this is all going to go uh, is going to come from the sky. So we're probably not massive advocates of setting up huge um, uh, arrays and towers and other things because you've got great firms out of Adelaide here like Miriota and Fleet and others all around the world that are going to throw up lots of um, low earth orbit satellites that are going to give us access to real time data and all of that infrastructure in all probability will become redundant and, and not the best use. I hasten to add, there are some areas where it's appropriate, but for what we're focused on, which is water in livestock, we, we have yet to see a business case where it makes sense. So typically, um, a, a client of ours will look, log in in the morning and they can look at multiple different views. 
This is a typical uh, property where you know, they, they've got a number of different water points and at a glance they can just look at how much water have I got. Now if any one of those were in an alert mode because there was less water or falling water too fast or whatever, it'd be red and then they can drill down, click through on that and drill down and look at it. Other people like to look at charts and get a feel for you know, what's going on in their water ecosystem and they can drill down on all of that. Um, other, other sorts of insights. And you know, out of this comes things like drawdown times on bores. You know, we're picking up information that we're, where there, many users are sucking air on bores and running t pumps, which means wear and tear on machinery. Or alternatively, on the far side there, you can see, you know, we clearly knew that this water ecosystem was going to run out. And you know this is not something that you can just know by driving to check water. I mean, you get there and you look at it and you go, and we're like, hang on, in three days' time, you're actually going to run out of water, so therefore you need to do X, Y, or Z. And again, this is sending alerts to the um, to the user. Um, so I'll show you a short video from one of uh, a typical scenario um, that we deal with, and then I'll come back to you. My name's Matt Wood, I'm the manager of Bliner Station, which is located about 150 k's east of Derby. We run 24,000 Brahman cattle over around just shy of a million acres. In a normal summer day in the north, an adult equivalent will consume 50 litres of water a day. So that means I'm chasing a million litres of water delivered into my trough over about 90 different watering points every day. And cattle don't care if it's Sunday or a public holiday or if it's someone's birthday. They need water every day, all day. We've been using FarmBot tank level monitors for three years now and saved us hugely in a, in a variety of different ways. Like a float falls off the trough and we lose a turkey nest of water or a beast breaks a pipe. We know there's a serious incident within an hour and we're able to respond before it turns into a drama. We're able to go out there and deal with it ASAP. And that's huge in, in this sort of scale of station. So I've recommended um, FarmBot to many neighbours um, and many friends, other, other colleagues in the industry, and I'll continue to do so. We've found the service really good. Um, seriously cheap insurance on probably the most important part of our business and that's water for livestock. Um, so as some of you may know, um, Bliner, that cattle station is actually um, one of Jumbuck's properties, um, a company that's based out of here in Adelaide, who are, um, who are great adopters of, uh, of early technology. Um, so that's a typical scenario, um, but, but you know, we, we have monitors operating in Tasmania, uh, Victoria and right here on, on your doorstep in, in Adelaide. I mean, the, the issues are different for different people. Obviously the tyranny of distance, the amount of labour, the amount of fuel, the wear and tear on vehicles in a, in a large cattle station operation is, is well known, um, but yet there's still people driving around checking a lot of water. Um, what we find closer to home here is, uh, is you know, people wanting to just know what's happening when they're in the city or when they're on a holiday or, you know, when they've got staff out there checking water that are they checking what they should be checking. Um, we've got heaps of examples of, um, that have been sent to us by our customers. This is one from in the Northern Territory with a, a user that had four units and, you know, he sent us, um, his name's Dan Lynch, he sent us a, a, his own assessment of, you know, look, Coppo, I've got four of those units and here's my P&L on, you know, on the devices. I think they've saved me over 20,000 bucks a year from what I was doing in the past. Um, so we started with this water monitoring piece, um, which obviously is still a huge challenge um, for agriculture the world over. Um, but that's really just our sort of Amazon sells books moment. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos knew selling books to people would be a, and if he could do it really, really well, he'd earn the right to sell 
books, uh, uh, lots of other things to people. And as we all know today, Amazon's one of the biggest retailers in the world. So for us, you know, our, our solving the water management problem on farm is the beginning of a discussion, as I mentioned, with our customers, not the end of it. Um, we're not into just booting hardware and then not turning up. We're actually into here is a really, really robust, reliable device. What else can we do with it? So we've now started on a customer-led innovation program, which is building out our ecosystem to the extent that now over 53% of all of our customers have a rain gauge attached to their farm bot, which again takes the data from the rain gauge and again zips it up to the satellite or to the 4G or MBIoT, whatever the comms is, and sends it back to the, um, the laptop or mobile. Uh, we've got an increasing number of people now that are using pressure and flow monitors. I know that's a big issue here in South Australia where people are paying for water and if they get leaks and they're losing water, it can be a very, very expensive pastime. So we're monitoring pressure and flow within the water ecosystem. We've got people uh, using the device as an SOS button where they get their staff to check in when they get to every water tank and then check out when they leave. Alternatively, there's a red panic button at every water tank that allows them to say, you know, I need help here now because we all know uh, there's a lot of injuries and deaths in the agricultural sector. Not something we should be proud of, but we've got to do more to look after our people when they're working in remote areas. And some of the other really interesting things we're working on, which we'll be launching sort of mid this year, include the ability to, to activate pumps remotely, so to turn pumps on and off from your mobile phone when you've got an alert, to take a photo when you need a photo um, in real time, so when you get an alert to be able to take a photo of your trough or the, however you set the camera up. Um, and uh, other... Uh, room, uh, electric fence monitoring and trough monitoring uh, are all things that we have got in trial at the moment. Most of them on trial uh, up at Romani on the MLA digital farm um, project. Again, with all of those things for us, um, um, a key point of differentiation, and I'll talk more about this in your thinking about adoption of ag tech, is that all of our devices are real time. And so in our mind, you're not actually in the Internet of Things if you aren't real time. Um, some people have a different view of that. But if you think about it, you know, we, we need to know when we've got an issue, when we've got the issue. If you've only got, um, you know, a, a, a report once a day uh, and one day it happens to get missed or it's one day at a set time, I don't know about you, but those newsletters that I get every day at a set time are normally become the last thing I read if I'm short on time. And given I've never met a farmer who has time, spare time on their hands, I think the farmers need to know when there's a problem, when there's a problem, so they can act on it. So all of our things are real-time reporting, not something that happens once a day. There are different use cases where once a day may be perfectly okay, but we've found when we're working with livestock, especially in remote areas, we need to know when we need to know. It's the same as if I just send you a photo every day at 8am, I guarantee you after a few weeks you won't, you'll stop looking at it because the first few weeks it, then there's nothing, you'll just stop looking at it. But when you do need a photo is when you get an alert that something's wrong in your water ecosystem and you want to take the photo right then and there and go, oh yes, there is a dead cow in the trough or the pipe has burst or you know, the, the float has been broken or whatever the scenario is. So we think um, the adoption of technology in real time reporting is a really super critical thing. Where this all goes, but uh, for us and for others is, and maybe the, the quest that everyone's trying to work out in this space is, you know, what's the infrastructure for the Internet of Things? What's the infrastructure I need on my property to do all of these things? Because one thing is sure, you don't want seven apps to run the farm. You don't want to pay seven different people for what we call backhaul, the communications from the paddock back to your desktop. So 
people will have to make choices around what sort of technology they want to use. And again, it will be different strokes for different folks. It won't all be satellite first, won't always be the best option. It's the option we've taken, but we'd use 4G and MBIOT and LoRa in some instances. Um, uh, and in other circumstances, there'll be other more appropriate forms of comms. But we actually see FarmBot as part of the infrastructure for IoT. We're collaborating with a whole bunch of different people in this sector. Um, I think AgriWeb's presenting next door. We've got a, a APIs with them. Uh, Maya Grazing, different people looking at soil moisture, um, a gate opening, a variety of different um, things where you know, we can collate that data and again send it back to the user in a form and in a format they want. Um, because the device is there, it's sitting on a tank, it's unassisted, it's on its own power for seven years. If it's transmitting to a satellite or to, to 4G, it, putting additional data in that and sending it to where it wants to go is not, is not a complicated thing to do in most circumstances. Um, so again, uh, for us, it's about real-time data resulting in actionable insights. We, we don't use the word data um, on the farm because data, just plethora of information, I mean, I think everyone's got data overload. The only thing that's important is what is the data telling me that would allow me to run my business better? That's the only bit that people really want to know. And we're mining all of our data to look at what can we learn from these water ecosystems that will be helpful for farming community to know and to act on that will allow for them to be more productive and more sustainable in their, in their enterprise. You can't, unfortunately, just grow uh, what you like with, the, with um, what you wish you had. You need to grow what you've got with what you've got. And these sort of tools will allow us to do that. Which plays out to this, um, you know, this big picture that's been talked about for a long time. But as the, you know, even with my, uh, without my FarmBot hat on and my AgriTech Australia Association hat on, and say, you know, and, and all of you here today, and the great startups here today, and the great technology that we are, is moving us ever closer to this, you know, how long, how many. What do I have to do? How do I optimise all of my assets and inputs on my farm to, to get my optimum return? And when I look at the data that we're generating and I merge that with climate and weather, I might merge that with my virtual fencing or my geotagging, I'm 100% I'm confident we will get to, you know, the right answer for this paddock is, you know, 44 days, 8 hours and 15 minutes unless otherwise advised. So if it rains, you'll have options. Do you extend the time or do you increase the carrying capacity? All of those variables happening in real time to inform people about their decisions. That's where it's all going and I think it's a super uh, exciting space. Um, we've got a, a good team. Uh, there's about 20 of us at FarmBot, as I mentioned, been around for quite a long time. And we're working um, with a lot of great sponsors uh, who are helping distribute our product and, you know, be remiss of me not to mention elders who have been great supporters of this event and, and who are great supporters of us. Uh, and, you know, they distribute FarmBot products um, around the country. Um, so I'll wind up there with five minutes of Q&A to go.